and is um, currently working with the dairy group and heads that up. Um, and um, is also involved with the National Mastitis Conference. So, um, without further ado, I'll hand over to Ian. All right, morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to attempt to sort of carry on the practical theme of this morning uh, and, and really try to talk a little bit about liners, liner selection, and teat health and how they, how they interact. Um, and, and I have to acknowledge uh, Doug Reinemann when I present this work. Uh, I've been lucky enough to be working with Doug um, on some elements of liner design for the last three or four years, uh, and anybody who has had the opportunity to go to University of Wisconsin, meet with Doug or, or spend any time working with him, will know it's, um, it's, it's a very great pleasure to work with that gentleman. Uh, and I've learned a huge amount over the last few years. So, so I'd clearly like to recognize his input into to what I'm going to talk about today. Now, this is one of my great frustrations that when people talk to me about post-milking teat condition, this is all they want to talk about hyperkeratosis, and it's as if it's the only adverse effect that we ever see on a cow's teat induced by a milking machine. So actually, when we're talking about post-milking teat condition, we should be going beyond hyperkeratosis. So we're more interested in just the rough or the very rough teat ends. What we should be interested in is the color of the teats after milking. We should be interested in whether the teat end is healthy, whether it's flattened and wedged or discolored. And we should be interested in whether we've got hard, congested rings of tissue at the top of the teat where it attaches on the udder. Any of those are symptoms of a poorly operating machine or incorrect liner selection. So, so to focus our attention purely on a hyperkeratosis is missing a trick. You can see this button is beginning to cause some frustration. So some of the things that we might want to think about when we're looking at, at some of the factors that affect post-milking teat condition. We can't rule out the effect of the cow's teat and the shape of the teat. Uh, we have a selection of teat shapes, long, short, narrow, pointed, flattened, inverted. The shape of the teat has a huge effect on what we see when the cluster is removed from the cow. We also can't avoid unit on time. Like it or not, the longer that we leave any milking unit on a cow, the greater the potential there is for an adverse effect to be seen. Unit on time is a huge driver of this. So that may be to do with milk yield, maybe to do with flow rate, <coughs> maybe to do with poor stimulation, it may be due with takeoffs. But, but unit on time is going to have a huge effect on that, as is low flow. So the period of time that we leave the cluster on the cow when the flow is below a kilogram a minute, we're moving into high risk period. Now, most people talk about settings on takeoffs at 300, 400, 500 kilograms, sorry, grams. I'm actually saying anything below 100 or one kilogram is a risk. I'm not suggesting we necessarily take the cups off at that point. But low flow, less than a kilogram a minute, is a risk factor from an adverse effect on the cow's teeth. Skin condition. We were talking last night a little bit about teeth disinfectants. Efficacy of the disinfectant, emollient levels, how well it's applied, where it's applied. If we have dry skin on a cow's teeth, a lot of these features and factors that we see are made significantly worse. So we have to have a soft, supple teeth. And then finish with the liner. We're only just beginning to understand how important the selection of the liner is to optimizing the cow's teat condition after milking. So where does the liner come in then? What is the role of the liner in optimizing teat condition? Well, we're going to be interested in the fit of the liner. So how well is it actually fitted to the teats on the farm? Has it been fitted or is it just this is the liner that we sell the most of, so it must be right for your herd. So where does the fit come in? What about the design of the liner, the shape of it, the material it's made out of, the thickness of the wall, the design of the head, 
the tension it's mounted under. All of those can affect the way it applies and interacts with the teat. And there's an interesting one, overpressure, which we'll talk about in a moment. Overpressure is a relatively new measurement, and when you actually begin to understand the dynamics of overpressure, it has a huge bearing on what we see at the end of a cow's teat. And then we're going to finish off talking a little bit about operating parameters. Uh, anybody who sat in on the presentation yesterday on uh, optimizing the milking machine, I touched very briefly on this concept of liner mapping or liner setup. Uh, and I want to take you through a liner map this morning just to really explain how it can actually allow us to set the, the, the milking machine and the liner up optimally for that individual herd. So we think about liner fit. As yet, I have not come across a herd anywhere that has standardized teats. <coughs> so we take a typical herd anywhere in the world, and we'll have teats that are that size, we'll have teats that are that size. We'll have teats of that size, and that size, and that size. This is a typical conventional commercial dairy herd. Now, what do we, what do we choose to milk them with? One liner. So one liner has to attempt <coughs> to accommodate that range of teat size, teat dimension. That's actually quite a difficult, difficult task. It's a big ask. But that's what we have to try and achieve. So how do we look at the fit of the liner? Now, you could argue that sizing a liner to a cow's teat is a little bit like putting an overweight person in a corset. If you put them in a corset and you stitch it up nice and tight, Everything looks quite presentable. What happens when you slacken the corset off? It just doesn't look quite so good. So we put a cow's teat into a liner. The liner is the corset. The liner supports the teat. So that is giving the teat structure some support. A liner or a teat is a fixed dimension. It's a fixed volume. So if a teat becomes fatter because it's stretched in that that dimension can't become longer. It can only move in one dimension. So typically, what we see in Europe is a prevalence of wider bore liners. And by wider bore, we're talking about a liner that is marginally larger than the width of the stimulated, average stimulated size of the teat in the herd. So the liner is marginally larger. So we start milking that teat. So we're milking the teat in the corset. Which dimension does the teat expand in? It expands horizontally. So the teat expands horizontally. It gets fatter. It's a fixed volume, so it can't extend down into the liner. We want it to extend into the liner because that's where the liner does its clever stuff. So as it pen the teat penetrates into the liner, then we start getting into compression. We get into to the reducing effects of edema. If the teat is sitting at the top of the liner, is unable to penetrate into it, there is no massage, there is no relief of vacuum going on. I showed you that selection of, of weird shaped teats and one liner. Did you notice there was one particular teat shape that was purple? Why do you think I chose a purple teat? Because that's the color the teat will be when a short-teated cow, or a short-teated animal, comes out of a wide bore liner, because the teat expands horizontally and it will not penetrate into the liner. So, I may be sort of slightly, um, well, you might think overstressing this issue of, of liner fit, but my greatest frustration at the moment is that people don't look critically at the size and range of teats within the herd. And when they choose a liner, there's very little guidance given in terms of what is the most appropriate liner for the herd. So looking at the size of the teats gives us a huge steer in terms of the liner we should be looking at. So the liner selection needs to take account of the average teat size in the herd. And that has to be post-stimulation, just pre-milking. Because we know when we stimulate a cow's teat, the teat will expand. That's the point we do the measurements. And the bit that we're trying to get some compression on is about the top, the bottom, 25 mils of the teat. 
That's the part that the liner needs to collapse on and apply a compressive load. So we're trying to get it at the base of the teat. And if we put a teat into a narrow bore liner, so we've put our teat into our corset and tightened it up, the teat will not stretch significantly horizontally, so it extends longitudinally down into the liner. So the teat comes down into the liner, into the point of liner collapse. So it's able to apply a compressive load towards the base of the teat. So the narrow bore liner allows the teat to expand, often by about 40% in its non-milking length. But then think about our poor heifer. And if you look at the mouthpiece of a liner, many of the liners on the market now have a mouthpiece depth that's 25 or 30 millimeters. You take a heifer's teat that's been stimulated, fairly fresh calved, that heifer's teat is not much more than 30 millimeters in length. Now you tell me how much massage that heifer's teat will be getting, particularly if you're milking it with a wide bore liner. So we'll end up with a heifer's teat that is poorly milked, congested, discolored, and then we ask ourselves, why won't she let her milk down? And it's because we're creating an incredibly uncomfortable milking environment. Now, historically, we've tended to milk in Europe with a wider bore liner because we have higher culling rates, we have different breed of cows than the US, um, market preferences, allegedly. So if you look at the, the range of bore of the liner, from narrow bore through to what you'd call a wide bore liner, you'll see the shift is generally with the US towards the narrower bore liner. Now, I would argue quite robustly, with many of the commercial herds that, that I deal with, their culling rates are very similar to North American herds. Their yields are very similar to North American herds. Their milking frequency is very similar to North American herds, and their genetics come from North America. So actually, are many of our European herds now that different to North American herds? I would suggest not. So why are we still historically believing that we need to be milking with wide bore liners in the UK? There are, of course, exceptions. And, and I had to take this picture when we talk about a range of teat sizes that we have to accommodate. This was a picture taken on a farm three weeks ago when I was doing some work in Turkey. 800 cow dairy unit, state of the art, opened the door to walk into the parlor to be faced with a herd of what they call flecties and I might call beef cattle. Now, I challenge anybody in this room to find a liner that's appropriate to milk these girls. So yes, there are exceptions to the rule, but as a generality, when you start looking at teat dimensions in the UK and compare them with the US, they're not as dissimilar as you think. The thing that is very interesting is when you look across the table, so you look at the US herds, a couple of quite large samples from the UK and then a tiny little sample from New Zealand, you notice the average size or the average width of the herds in the UK. The teat width is larger than the US. Now these are multi-lactation animals. These are not just heifers, this particular sample. So if you take a heifer and you milk her in a wide bore liner, over time, what happens to the width of the teat of that animal? going to increase. So you can see we get this creeping effect of milking with wider bore liners in Europe. The teats adapt to fit the liner that we milk them with. But look at the teat length. Not that dissimilar. So if we think about the actual features of the liner and how we can get it to work on the cow's teat, we know the four phases of the pulsation cycle. We know the liner opens, the liner is fully open, the liner is closing, and then the liner is fully closed. So we have the four phases. In terms of actually trying to get good post-milking teat condition, we're interested in how long the liner is fully open for. We're interested in the level of vacuum that it's exposed to for that period of time. But we're also very interested in what happens 
when the liner closes. Because if you take the analogy of a cow's teat as being the same as your thumb in a vacuum cleaner, put your thumb in a vacuum cleaner and switch it on, what will happen to your thumb? So some people have done this, haven't they? <laughs> it's going to swell, it's going to become congested, it's going to become very uncomfortable, and it will become red. Now, if you can physically get your thumb out the vacuum cleaner and squeeze it, then put it back in again, pull it out and squeeze it, after three or four cycles, the swelling will reduce, the pain will reduce, and so will the discoloration. Because by squeezing your thumb, you're squeezing all the fl lymphatic fluid in the blood back into the teat. And that's exactly what we expect the liner to do when the teat is in there during the liner closing phase. So we want the liner to collapse around the teat, we want to squeeze it, but that's all we want it to do. And it balances, so the, the closing of the liner balances the build-up of congestion and the build-up of edema that we begin to get towards the end of the liner open phase. So we're balancing the B phase, the open phase, with the closed phase. And what you actually begin to see, and I showed this slide yesterday, Here's a teat mounted in an open liner, and this is a silicon pipe that's been inserted up through the short milk tube, through the end of the teat canal, up into the teat sinus. When the liner is fully open, and there's the teat taking its normal shape, you'll notice that the silicon pipe is open to its full bore. There's no restriction to milk flow. Then we go to the D phase where the liner collapses. So here's our closed liner. Now the first thing to notice is see how the shape of the teat end changes. It becomes quite flattened. So what we're starting to get is the teat, when it acts, it's applying pressure. When the liner act, it closes, it applies pressure on the end of the teat, which starts to ease this congestion. But look further, look what happens to the inside of the teat canal. So that silicon pipe actually becomes shut. So the pressure applied from the outside of the teat is transferred right through the teat tissue and is applied on the inside of the teat canal. Now why is that important? If you get a mixed group and you look around the room, you can see who sits in an office and drives a computer and you can see who does proper work because you look at the calluses on their hands. What's a callus? Now a callus is excessive skin production. Your hand responds to a physical challenge by producing extra cells. Those extra dermal cells are there to protect your hand. So that's produced in response to a trauma, a regular constant trauma, and it <coughs> protects itself. I showed you a slide early on about hyperkeratosis. We talk about teat end growth on the end of a teat and describe it as hyperkeratosis. The Dutch, who've done a lot of work, particularly Francesca Nienhaus, talks about teat end callosity. The clue is in the name. So what we actually see when we start to get hyperkeratosis is callousing at the teat end. And it's excessive production of keratin deposited on the teat end from the teat canal. Now, I showed you a picture of the teat canal being squeezed physically shut by the closing liner. If you squeeze it too hard, or you squeeze it too regularly, you produce extra keratin, and that extra keratin deposits on the end of the teat canal, on the outside of the teat. So what that begins to allow <coughs> us to build this picture so we start to think there is a link between T10 condition score, or levels of hyperkeratosis, and actually how much of a squeeze that liner applies. So we need it to relieve congestion. Ideally, we want it to cease milk flow during the D phase, but we don't want it to squeeze any harder than that. Any extra pressure it applies beyond the easing of congestion is excessive. It's overpressure. Now, if you think about most milking systems on the market, pulsate somewhere around about 60 pulses a minute, give or take one or two phases. So if we say 60 pulses a minute, 
and we go back to the cow we were talking about yesterday, who's going to milk on average for six minutes. 360 times per milking, that teat canal is shut by the closing liner and has excessive pressure applied to it. You put the unit and leave the unit on for an extra two minutes, that's another 120 closures of the teat canal. So you can begin to understand why things like low flow periods, vacuum level and over milking interact and produce hyperkeratosis. But the amount of closing pressure we get, the overpressure, you can see how it directly relates to teat congestion and teat end hyperkeratosis. So the excessive pressure applied by the closing liner, the greater the pressure, the worse the teat end score. Now what does that mean in practice? What it means in practice is this range from overpressure of 2 kPa up to over 13 kPa. These are liners, off the peg liners, that you can pick up in Europe, you can pick up in the US. People are milking cows in herds around the world with these liners today. With a range of overpressure from 2 to 13 kPa. And yet we know, as the overpressure increases, T10 condition deteriorates. And this is a sample of about 20 milking liners. It's a snapshot of what's out there. So if you follow that logic through, the more liners we test, potentially the bigger range we're going to see. So the other feature that we then start to think about is clearly we become very interested in the fit of the liner. So how well fitted is it to the teats in the herd? We become very interested in the compressive load or the overpressure that the liner's applying. But we then start thinking about the mouthpiece, chamber, vacuum. Now I showed you a picture earlier of, of what looked like ringing at the top of the cow's teat, a hard, palpable ring of tissue. What that is, is the teat, sensitive teat tissue being drawn into the chamber of the mouthpiece. But we cannot design a liner that does not have a mouthpiece because the liner mouthpiece vacuum is the bit that keeps the liner on the cow's teat. It stops it slipping. It provides stability. So we need mouthpiece vacuum. That's a given. But what we do know is that the amount of vacuum we get in the mouthpiece is highly correlated to the size of the teat. So a small teat in a big liner will have a very poor seal around the barrel of the teat, a lot of vacuum escaping around the side of it, and a high mouthpiece vacuum. which is a problem on most milking units. It can be a problem where this is a classic printout from what you would describe as a fairly typical vacuum recording of a typical milking. The green is the vacuum in the short milk tube. So fairly steady cyclic fluctuations. About this point, the vacuum increases in the short milk tube and the scale of the cyclics reduces. By my definition, around about this point, we've got to the end of milking. So this period to me is moving into over milking. What's very interesting is when you move to the period of over milking, the red and the green traces are the vacuum in the mouthpiece. So during that period of time when we hit the low flow period, invariably mouthpiece vacuum jumps. That could be a slight problem on that cow because we've got there a period of about a minute where we have fairly high mouthpiece chamber vacuums. But it might be more of a problem with this cow, where we've got a very similar effect. The ACR does, has done exactly what it's designed to do. We've got to the period here, we've hit the low flow period, vacuum in the short milk tube's increased, cluster's been removed. But look what happened to the mouthpiece vacuum of, in this particular instance, that's a front quarter. The front quarter milked out more quickly than the rear quarter. Mouthpiece vacuum increased significantly. So we're now over milking, and we're over milking with a high mouthpiece vacuum on a front quarter. The rest of the unit's milking away quite happily and is recording beautifully. This rear quarter 
surface, not got a problem at all. The milk's coming from the rear quarters. But we've got a chunk of time here where we have a high mouthpiece chamber vacuum for that individual cow. And what we know is at peak milk flow, which is this period of time here, most units will have a mouthpiece chamber vacuum less than 10 kPa. And at 10 kPa, it does not cause a problem. But when we start to hit low flow and the vacuum in the mouthpiece increases, we start to get congestion. And the alarm bell should start ringing when we hit 20 kPa. Anything above 20 kPa is going to lead to this unpleasant, nasty ringing at the base of the teat. Which is one of the reasons that some manufacturers have looked at trying to manage the mouthpiece vacuum. So we worry about chamber vacuums. We worry about potential teat ringing and congestion. <coughs> So if you put a vent in the mouthpiece and you allow a certain amount of air into the mouthpiece, you stop the vacuum level increasing. You don't drop it to zero, but it doesn't go much over the 10 kPa. And what we seem to see is, is much better control of mouthpiece chamber vacuums when you put a vent in there. And this is what you tend to get. So we're now looking at the low flow period. So here's a conventional non-vented unit. So a mouthpiece chamber vacuum at the low flow period is up somewhere around about 35 kPa. Remember we said anything above 20, alarm bells should start ringing. So here we are sat at 30. You put a hole into the mouthpiece of the liner, you get this swinging mouthpiece vacuum. So the average is significantly lower and the ringing is significantly reduced. And based on the, the potential benefits of controlling mouthpiece vacuum, there was a study done in Belgium last year. Uh, 20, 20 Flemish farms, nothing fancy about these farms. These were just run-of-the-mill commercial dairy units. They ran for a six-month period, 1,700 cows in total, and they tried a mouthpiece vented liner. And the most significant difference that was noted, there was a very slight reduction over the period in time in cell counts, but but you all know as well as I do, to see over a six month period, a, a reduc average reduction cell count of 10,000, you're not really gonna get very excited about that. What was interesting, because again, we know the link between particularly t and hyperkeratosis and pneumostitis infections. When you look at the percentage of teats, they're describing them as frayed, so we would describe those as rough or very rough T10s, over the six month period, they went from having 31% teats rough or very rough, and that reduced to 7%. The percentage of cow's teats that had no ring or a smooth ring increased from 69% to 93%. So as somebody who's actively in the field working, trying to improve T10 condition, that made my ears prick up. So as with all good researchers, you, took, you look at work that's done anywhere else other than the UK and assume that it can't possibly be right, so we better replicate it at home. So we did, and we did this on a farm, and we ran it over a 12-month period. Uh, this is a 200 cow herd, 12,000 litres milking three times a day. Now, the first point I would, I would add, or start with, is considering the yield that these guys were running at and their milking frequency, their starting point for T10 hyperkeratosis scores was actually very acceptable. They were scoring about 2.3, which, which I, was, I was not unhappy with. We then tried this particular liner. Over this 12-month period, we got a reduction down to about 1.6. So that, I find, quite an interesting development. And I think what we're seeing here is a combination of controlling the mouthpiece vacuum plus possibly something to do with the compressive load that that particular liner applies, because it tends to be a lower compressive load liner. So we could talk about liner design, but actually irrespective of the liner that we've got fitted, how about we actually use it properly? Change it at the right frequency? So a liner, particularly a liner mouthpiece, should be round. 
because most teats that you see when the liner goes on them are round. So here we have a liner that's possibly best described as slightly past its sell-by date. That liner is incapable of forming a correct seal with the base of the teat. So we're going to get uncontrolled air admission from here. We're going to get slower milking and we're going to get more liner slippage. And when we look at what happens when a liner ages, typical recommendation in the UK would be somewhere about two and a half thousand milkings to change. In the US, it's near 1,200. US liners change twice as frequently as ours because <coughs> they're not allowed to put paraphenyldiamine or carbon black in the formulation. The reason that they're not allowed paraphenyldiamine and carbon black is because both products are carcinogens. One gives the product elasticity and the other gives it some ozone protection. So if you take out cancer product, cancer causing products from a liner, they might not cause cancer, but they'd have to be changed twice as frequently. And I think it's possibly fair to say that as time goes on, that the US type formulation is going to come, we're going to come under pressure in Europe to be looking at a US type formulation with more frequent change. But at the moment, two and a half thousand milkings. So we're in about here. Go beyond two and a half thousand milkings, the ability of the liner to harvest milk drops and drops quite markedly. And we also see a significant increase in strip yields. So the amount of residual left in the udder when the cups are removed, when the teats or when the liner goes beyond two and a half thousand milkings, we start to see a significant increase in residual milk. So an old liner milks more slowly, it milks with a lower flow rate, and it leaves more milk in the udder. I'm glad this presentation's nearly over. Cleaning a liner, cleaning a liner that's new and cleaning a liner that's old. This is the surface of a new liner magnified 200 times. So it's, it's got that nice, shiny, clean black effect that you're used to seeing. And you would be comfortable and confident that you could make a good effort to clean that liner. Same liner after milking 2,000 cows. So it hasn't even hit its 2,500 threshold. Look how the surface changes. And this, this roughness that you see is reflected in that slight graying that you get on the inside of the rubber surface. So you begin to get a breakdown of the surface of the rubber. And what that means is, and this is some work uh, by Thum, who is a, Danish res uh, a Dutch researcher, you look at the number of bacteria per square centimetre as the liner ages, and you hit 1,500 milkings, and you suddenly start to get quite a marked increase in contamination of the liner. In other words, the sanitising process that's being applied is insufficient to cope with the increasing roughness of the surface of the liner. So just to finish off then, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about setting up the liner. Now, I showed you a liner map yesterday for anybody who's in the presentation. And what we're trying to achieve, and we're not there yet, we're not there by a long way, is we're trying to establish a way of actually plotting the performance of individual liners so we can go and apply that knowledge on any dairy farm anywhere. Now, the way that we have to do it is going back to this basic fundamental understanding of the relationship between how long the liner is open and exposing the teat to vacuum, but also how high is that vacuum. And what we know is that the longer the liner is open, the greater the risk for the teat to start to become swollen and congested. If you increase the vacuum level at the same time as increasing the duration of exposure, you get a double whammy. So what we have to try and do is balance the period of time the liner's open with the level of vacuum it's exposed to. So if we start at the bottom with a, a liner exposure period of 300 milliseconds, that's the minimum B phase required by the British standard. And if anybody in this room who has cows and is milking cows and milk cows at home this morning, if you set your parlor up with a B phase according to the minimum from the ISO standard of 300 milliseconds, you wouldn't be here in this presentation now. 
because you would still be milking. So it's the minimum standard, but nobody would run at 300 milliseconds. It's a very short, liner, open period. But because it's a short period of time, you can crank up the vacuum and the average flow rate continues to increase. So it's less sensitive to vacuum because the period of duration, the exposure period, is a lot less. Now, most people in the room who are milking cows will be milking with a B phase probably nearer 500 milliseconds, somewhere between 450 and 500. So it's open for 150 or 200 milliseconds longer. So that extra period of duration means it becomes more sensitive to the level of vacuum it's exposed to. And you can see this. As the vacuum level starts to increase from 38 to 41, you get an increase in flow rate. You go beyond 41, because you're now in a combination of it being exposed for quite a long time at a higher vacuum level, the rate of increase starts to tail off. Now, you go to the extreme setting, which is 600 milliseconds, which most people would consider to be fairly suicidal in terms of milking efficiency because the liner is open for too long. Although you may start with a higher flow rate, you increase the vacuum by 3 kPa, you get just a marginal increase in flow rate. You go beyond 41 kPa, your flow rate is coming down. Now, that is telling you that the combination of higher vacuum and excessive exposure is causing the teat to swell, the teat orifice to become occluded, and your milk flow rate is going down. The, the closuring effect on the D phase is insufficient to compensate for the high vacuum and the high exposure. So when we develop the, the liner maps, which I'm going to show you in a moment, when we look at a various number of scenarios of, of period of time the liner is open with different vacuum levels, very simple piece of science to do, but incredibly time consuming, because we have to set the parlor up for one milking with a B phase and a vacuum level. We take all the data, we collect all the milk flows, and we look at all the teat condition effects. And then we change the settings for the next milking, and on we go. So it potentially takes up to 16 milkings to collect the data to produce one map, which is why at the moment we've got seven liner maps and no more because of the sheer cost and time involved with gaining the information. This little box of tricks, our black box, can actually collect the data for a particular liner in a, a single milking, in that within the space of one milking, we can adjust the vacuum level and the pulsation B phase in 15 second increments. So we have a five second carryover between treatments, but we can collect the information for a liner map now at one milking. The only downside, as you can imagine, we are now, as you can see, we're in a milking parlor here. This would not be described as particularly durable equipment at the moment. So we've got some work to do on this, but, but I just wanted to share that with you because my frustration at the moment is we have so few liner maps because of the challenges of getting the data. This, I think, is going to be the way that's going to help us dramatically because we can do it much more cost effectively. Seven liner maps at the moment. And when we first started looking at how every liner changes and behaves differently, with different B phase length and vacuum level, we started to produce these three-dimensional charts for each liner. Now, they just take a little bit of getting your head around. So we have the average milk flow here, we have the B phase duration there, and we have the system vacuum here. Now, for somebody who's been working on this for four years, I have to confess, I put my hand up, I still look at these three-dimensional charts, and I have to scratch my head a little bit. They're not actually that easy to interpret. So the thing that I would ask you to take from that one particular slide is all of those charts are different. Don't worry about the shape, but they are all different. So these are standard vacuum and pulsation settings, and the shapes of each of these curves is quite different. So that's telling us that every one of those liners is behaving quite differently as we adjust the vacuum and as we adjust the pulsation. So trying to get 
these into a more user-friendly format, we've come up with this, which is the same data, but it's a lot more user-friendly. And I just want to take you through, effectively, how you would read a map. Now, bear in mind, this is a map for one liner. And if you remember from that previous slide, each of the liners behaves quite differently as you adjust vacuum and pulsation. So we cannot take that map and apply it to every liner that's out there. These are specific to the liner that's tested. So if you go to a dairy farm, and the first question you might ask the guy is, what is your objective? What do you want to achieve here? Do we want to achieve efficient, fast milking, or do we want to achieve optimal teat condition? So that would be the first question you would need to determine. What is his objectives? What does he need to achieve from this? So if we take what we might describe as a run-of-the-mill settings, a B phase of 400 milliseconds and a claw vacuum at peak milk flow. So this is not system vacuum. This is vacuum underneath the cow's teat at peak milk flow of 42 kPa. So the chances are this is going to be, well, this actually was a swing-over plant with a, a system vacuum of about 46 kPa. So with a setting of this liner, 400 milliseconds, and a claw vacuum of 42, we're getting about 88% of the potential maximum milking speed for that liner. So is he interested in milking speed, or is he interested in post-milking teat condition? He's losing potentially 12% of his milking speed at that setting, but for teats, that are greater than three centimeters in length, there is a low risk of an adverse effect on that cow's teat. So minimal risk of teat congestion, losing 12% of the potential milking speed of that liner. So he may turn around to you and say, not fast enough, I need more than 88% of available milking speed. So we can look at the map and we can start to pick a higher figure. Now, for example, we might choose to go here. We can get that liner set up to milk much faster, leave the pulsation the same, but increase the system vacuum. But we then live, move into a higher risk of teat end congestion and teat barrel congestion. So do you see how we can suddenly start to pay off one against the other? Because we can actually begin to at last understand the relationship from an individual liner the relationship between vacuum and liner open period, or B phase. So we need to understand that this is claw vacuum at peak milk flow, and that's important then that we understand the relationship between a low-level system and a midi-level system. So we're going to get a bigger vacuum drop under the claw for a midi-level system than we would with a low-level. So to start having these sorts of debates, the first thing we need to do is ascertain the system vacuum and the claw piece vacuum at peak milk flow. That gives you a starting point. And of course, bearing in mind that we're always working with teats that are more than 30 millimeters in length. But we talked earlier about the effect of the low flow period. So this period when we hit one kilogram per minute or below in terms of low flow. If we have less milk in the system, cyst or claw vacuum goes upwards because we've got less milk to dissipate and dilute the vacuum. So as the system vacuum, the system vacuum stays the same, when we move to low flow, the claw piece vacuum is going to increase. And we saw that from those dynamic traces I showed you earlier, where the green line when she gets to low flow, the green line goes up. So what we see is that although we might set the plant up beautifully here for the peak flow period, bear in mind what happens to that particular liner when we hit low flow. We hit low flow, we're moving quite rapidly into this area of high risk of teat congestion. So when we start to think about how we set the liner up using the liner map, the other thing we need to be very, very aware of is the setup of the takeoffs on the ACRs. So that was a little bit of a gallop through rubbers and liners. Hopefully, 
following on from the first presentation this morning, some practical things we can actually take away. The first thing that I would like everybody to take a little bit more notice in is the fit of the liner. So when you're on a farm and you're looking at, at any milking system, look at the size of the teats on the farm and relate them to the size and the bore of the liner that's currently being fitted. And in many cases, in many cases you'll find that the liner that you're milking with currently on the farm is probably marginally large for the herd that you're milking them with. Because historically we've milked with wider bore liners. So the way to establish that is do some teat measurements. So let's make sure we've got the right liner for the fit of the teat. Think about the design of the liner <coughs> and this issue of overpressure. Overpressure is a relatively new phenomenon. We haven't got a huge amount of information. As time goes on, we will start to see overpressure measurements starting, hopefully, to appear on the literature and the cards that come out with liners. That will be my dream, because that way we can make a more informed decision on the type of liner that we're milking with. And then finally, let's start thinking about how we're setting up these liners. So yes, a starting point is always run with the manufacturer's recommendations. So they will tell you the rate and the ratio that they expect that particular liner to operate at. And that has to be your starting point. But once it's all bedded in, if you want to start looking at T10 condition, if you think it could be improved, or you think there could be some possible improvements in milking efficiency, then let's start looking at how we use a map to navigate our way around those vacuum and pulsation settings. Thanks very much. Okay, um, the guys, the mics should be around. So, um, are there any questions over here? Great. Thank you. Hi, Ian. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any practical steps we can take without using your little relief valves, uh, some of the work you're doing with those. Um, new liners on uh, front quarters are obviously going to milk out quicker than rear quarters, and obviously they're going to the front quarter, uh, the front tee ends going to be under a lot more pressure, a lot more um, vacuum. And you know, most of us are farmers are you know haven't got that technology yet. Is there anything we can do? Or is it just simply a compromise um, with ACR take off take off times and I think the, vacuum? the you're, you're right. I mean, the, the, the glib answer. Is, is rip out your nice new parlor and put in a robot. Because of course, that, that works on a per quarter basis. That's the glib answer. Um, and what the robot really graphically describes is what our dynamic measurements will take. So if you watch a robot milking, the cups don't all come off at the same time. And you could be looking at a minute, minute and a half from the first takeoff to the last. So that, that's a feature of what we have to deal with. I think there's, there's two things you could do. The, the first, and, and I have to my knowledge that routinely it would be GEA that would do it routinely, is that they will have a slightly lighter shell on the front quarter. The argument being that a little bit of extra weight slightly increases the milking speed. So if you have a slightly lighter shell on the front, only 10 or 15 grams lighter, it should possibly slightly reduce the milking speed on the front quarters. The other point that's probably even more practical is, and, and I, didn't, I didn't show you any lactic order recording, so these are milk flow curves that we can take. If you look at a really well, and this is me getting on my bandwagon again, you look at a really well stimulated cow who's, who's given sufficient preparation time and left long enough, and by pre sufficient preparation time, I'm not talking two or three seconds of a cursory wipe, a proper decent stimulation period, and then left for 90 seconds at least. You look at the end of her milk flow curve, it's very clearly defined. If you look at a lactic order recording or a milk flow curve from a less well stimulated curve, it looks a cow, sorry, it looks as though you're going down the stairs. And you can see the effect of quarters dropping off. So so the two practical things would be possibly a lighter shell, easier to do in some cases than others. The other thing would be be absolutely anal about your preparation so that it brings all the full quarters closer together. Would you move to um, uh, splitting your pulsation front to back instead of side to side? 
Yep, it's an option. Yeah, it's commonly done in the US. I, uh, my only problem with that is, um, and perhaps it's just the, and I have to be careful because I do have some clients in the room, um, perhaps it's some of the clients I work with that that's all fine when it's set up and working correctly. The first time that the heifer kicks it off, dismantles it on the standing by jumping on it, in the middle of a milking it's all put back together again, and, and it's put back together the incorrectly, so you get the ratios operating incorrectly. That's a minor point, but yes, it, it, it's commonly done in the US. So if you had a, if you had say on the front quarters, you had a 60-40 ratio, so perhaps 60% of the milking cycle is milking, or the pulsation cycle, and then on the back you'd have a 65% ratio, so 65% would be, would be milking. That would, again would bring them closer together. But again, easier to do with some systems than others. Okay, any, any other questions? Yeah, D David Wenner from uh, GEA. Uh, well done, Ian. You've taken a very, very complicated uh, subject and started bringing it out into the what was previously regarded as black art is now out in the uh, public domain. And I commend the work that you're doing in, in yeah. bringing understanding a more detailed understanding of what's going on to the, the farmers before us. Of course, they can't, can only use one liner generally in their systems, and uh, in, in trying to bring the information out, it might add in short period of time to a little bit more confusion. Um, I'd just like to make a couple of comments regarding the presentation, and uh, it, it, the liner has often been a uh, I've worked for two manufacturers over 30 years and been directly responsible for these product programs in the UK and uh, to some extent the liner is a victim sometimes of uh, it's the slave in the in the milking system but it's it's also been the product area where people have been able to say let's start manipulating liner design to fix something else that was wrong within the parlor or cluster system so uh, it, it's when you look at the variety of things that have gone on around the world at different times different manufacturers it's because someone then said, let's start fiddling with the mm -hmm. liner. And the fiddling with the liner both learnt to new knowledge, but also it learnt to range uh, differentiation, if you like, different uh, developments in different places around the world. So the liner has been a sort of uh, a passive victim of people changing things. Uh, we talk about, in your presentation, EU and US designs, and I would comment an earlier time when the, in the UK there was much more specific UK based work that uh, the UK designs were probably more akin to US sizes. Mm -hmm. It's the process of globalization to some extent that puts us into having different uh, possibilities uh, available from Europe, say, for, for, for us. At GEA, our most common sold design is actually more akin to a NZ or US type size of liner, not a European wider liner, yeah. you know, so I think we have to be careful exactly how we I think the position yeah, that. Yeah, that I think the point I was trying to make is, is almost challenging our industry in the UK and Europe to, to actually be more objective about thinking about the liner that they should mm. choose. So actually the, the best way to make an informed decision about an appropriate liner is to first off do some measurements of the teats. Yeah. And so I think we, we, with the farms in the room and that, we, we, we would like to work with you in this process going forward, educate the industry better. I think we talked about materials there that come into it, and uh, whilst there are issues around the nitro rubber, rubber, there are European laws and, you know, changes of material do apply in Europe as, as they do in the US. The silicon alternatives, if we wish mm -hmm. to move to something else. Cluster weight, cluster design. I know the company's put an enormous amount of effort in designing things to work in the best situation with the belief that when they launch these products that the market will be educated, as you say, with preparing cows properly to use things in the best possible way, perhaps to use cluster support if that was necessary. They become available and on the market and then are not used in the way in which they were originally designed or intended. So yeah. that, that too becomes a, a problem. Then we fix the problem in reverse by changing the liner. Mm. So uh, there's quite a confusing set of underlying parameters beyond those that you already touched on that, at the T end that cause us to have a very yeah. mixed behaviour in the world, yeah? yeah. 
Okay, moving on. Any other at the back there, please, Graham? Uh, Ian, it, it's uh, Toby March. Um, interestingly, you mentioned the ISO standard. Is it? It's, it's nearly 20 years since we, we we worked on that standard. I think we worked on it together, isn't it? About time we changed it. I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff has come through that just didn't exist in the 90s. No, 2007 is the latest redraft. Well, even that, but that draft will have started about five years before then. So it's, the, it's called the nature of the beast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, a good point, but. But yeah, I mean, the the typically the ISO standard gets revised every 10 years. And, and so 2007, in theory, within the next three years, it will start to be considered again. It will be back on the agenda. It's on the agenda of the farm management group, but the, the milking machine committee of the IDF, which does it, doesn't exist at this current moment. Okay, any other questions? Okay, um, thank you very much, Ian.